Well, the chances of Alec Murdoch seeing the light of day ever again, uh, not very good. As he's been sentenced to 40 years in federal prison for his financial crimes. Far more than was originally suggested, by the way. Uh, pretty much securing that even if the murder trial is overturned, he'd be damn near 100 uh, if, for some reason, everything went perfect for him. Because uh, this one ain't getting overturned. And federal terms, they pretty much last a good portion of the term. It's not uh, like uh, state terms and things of that nature where you can get out at a lower percentage. Typically, we're talking 90% plus that he's going to have to serve at a very minimum, very likely the whole damn thing. So in, in that same vein, this guy is going to be in prison for the rest of his life. He's not going to get out. He's not going to get out on good behavior. I'm no. served. None of that. Why doesn't he just say, you know what, to a whatever, a reporter, a lawyer, a judge, bring somebody in. I want to talk for a second. And just say what really happened. Because he's a narcissist. Just tell the truth. Why, do, why would he care? He doesn't care. He wants to preserve whatever. He wants to go down as this is who I am. And I'm going to always deny this forever. And that's it. He In part of the, the stiff sentencing here on the 40-year federal term, uh, which was originally suggested to be like a 17 to 22 year old, 22 term, um, is because he failed a lie detector test. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, let's go into the story. Um, uh, he's uh, received that 40 year federal prison sentence for his involvement in financial crimes. The verdict handed down amidst uh, the existing life sentence for the murders of his wife and son. In the courtroom presided by U.S. District Judge, Judge Richard Gurgle, Murdoch was uh, condemned for exploiting his legal position to defraud clients and his law firm for over two decades. Judge Gurgle. In delivering the sentence, emphasized the egregious nature of Murdoch's offenses, highlighting how he preyed upon society's most vulnerable. The federal sentence, which runs concurrently with a 27-year state prison term, solidifies a total of 40 years behind bars for Murdoch, contingent upon any successful appeals in his murder cases. Prosecutors seeking a harsher, harsher penalty raised concerns about Murdoch's incomplete disclosure of stolen funds and implicated another attorney and his illicit activities. Throughout the proceedings, Murdoch expressed remorse for his actions, attributing his behavior to decades long battle with opioid addiction. However, both the judge and prosecutors remain skeptical of his claims, citing the intricate nature of his financial manipulations. So he kind of did what he did at his last one, where he goes, I'm sorry, guys, and did a little speech. Um, and I was, I don't believe there was a video or audio of this actual proceeding. Because um, I was really mm -hmm. wanting to to hear it, but attorney Justin Bamberg, representing several of Murdoch's victims, underscored the profound impact of his crimes, emphasizing the emotional and financial toll exacted upon innocent individuals. Murdoch is now embarking on his federal prison term. The uh, community continuing to grapple with the aftermath of his deceit uh, and betrayal. Uh, so yeah, and the polygraph on this, they did a polygraph uh, asking him more about the. Uh, the money, the $6 million that nobody knows where the hell it went. Uh, and he mm -hmm. failed the polygraph. Now, whoops. You can't use that in court in terms of the actual trial itself, but the judge took it into consideration here uh, in terms of, okay, take the polygraph and you failed it. Um, so he's still lying. There's still, he know there's, there's a more to the story of where that money went. Um, and I have no idea where it went, but uh, I, I do wonder uh, about his defense. I do wonder how they're being paid, even though it's supposedly pro bono, how they had been paid, uh, all that. I think there's there's some interesting places there, and I think there's some people who know where the bodies are buried, other than just Alec Murdoch. I, I, I just don't get this guy. I mean... When you look at the people that were affected by this, there was a state trooper that was injured on the job. There was a quadriplegic who was, um, mm -hmm. you know, injured, I think, in a car accident, uh, retired people that he stole from. He didn't care who he took from. It wasn't yeah. like like he was pretending to be Robin Hood and taking from the rich. He was taking from, the poor. from people who struck. Exactly. Yeah. He did an opposite of of Robin Hood. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, it's because he has no empathy and he's a malignant narcissist. And that's really all you need to know. That pretty much explains Alec Murdoch right there. They don't have any empathy. It doesn't process in their brains. It just, it, it doesn't happen. It just goes back to the me, 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 what's going to be best for me. And in their mind, that's the best route because that's how their brain works. It takes outside influences to come in and say, hey, wait a second here. What are you doing? And if you're doing it secretively and you know you're getting away with it, you may recognize from past indiscretions or somebody telling you that this is not okay, that socially this is not right, but still you don't feel it to be wrong. So they just keep doing it. And it's not just money. It's anything in their life. They don't have it. So one could execute your kid and your wife uh, or, or know who did it. Uh, and be able to sit there and lie and lie and lie uh, because it's self-preservation of yourself. And that's what ultimately matters most to someone like this. And that's, I was just going to ask, you've been following this case from the beginning. Do you think he's the one who pulled the trigger? Just, just an opinion. I think it's a high probability. I don't know for sure. Uh, but I think it's a very high probability. And if it wasn't him, he knows who did. And it was all ultimately about him. It was all. What do you think the motive would have been? To get attention off of the financial crimes and then that people would have pity for him and that hopefully he would get a lesser sentence or not much of anything because he was going through such a horrible, horrible thing. Yeah. Uh, and that that's how that was going to work out. And obviously it did not, but I think that was the original motive for it. It was all self-preservation and what, what better way to have pity for you than your wife and son are executed on your property. And it looks somewhat like it could have happened. There's somewhat of a story where one could be very pissed off at the Murdoch's and willing to go after and murder them uh, in revenge of what, took place on that boat with their or the financial crimes or the financial crimes or God knows what else was going on behind the scenes of Alec Murdoch's life. I, I, I think that it, it looked on the surface that there'd be enough probable cause to think that maybe this was a revenge killing because of the boat uh, or, or maybe the financial crimes. I don't know, but there had been threats to, uh, to Paul for quite some time. And he knew that. That was the first thing he told police when they showed up. He immediately had the story. He immediately said, well, oh, it's all these threats all the time about the boat accident. Or, I'm paraphrasing, but he, the first thing he said to investigators was about the boat accident. He immediately fed them a narrative. Not like, am I in danger? Is my other kids in? Like what? It was, here's the narrative. I hope you run with it. Wow. So... You ever met anybody like him? <laughs> uh, not that I've known to have been able to pull off murder. Uh, some that I could see, of, you know, could be capable of it. <laughs> um, oh, but, um, but like malignant narcissist, yes, I've met many throughout my life. Uh, but never that that have gone to that, uh, you know, to the, to a murderous route where it becomes criminal. I don't know what other things some people may have done that have been criminal, but um, but in terms of that level of belief and lack of empathy and just ability to just screw over anybody in their life, no matter how important they supposedly are or should be to them for their own gain or their own self-preservation. Yes. And there's a lot of them out there. I think these are, these are people that are not, villainous wearing the cape in the corner <laughs> like oh there's that vi they're the school teacher they're the police officer they're the politician they're the doctor they're the they're the people what we see every single damn day yeah and they're all around us and they know how to wear those masks pretty good because if they don't you don't have something that they need you're not going to really notice anything from them they can play well with others usually to a certain extent on the surface usually gets pretty destructive if you get to know them more. But on the surface, they're able to get by pretty well and be pretty cunning. You'd be pretty uh, much looked at by many people as 
very uh, charismatic, a good guy or a good go- girl or not good, good woman. Um, and uh, it's you, you don't see it. And that's why they're able to get along and and do what they do. If you're in relationships with people like this, you're not going to see it right away. It's a, I mean, unless they're the grandiose type narcissist. Uh, but a lot of it is covert narcissism. And that's done exactly how it's said in a very covert way. And oftentimes their victims don't realize it until they've gone too far. So they're out there. (laughs) Yeah, I, you know, and I didn't mean to turn this into let's interview Tony here, but I, I'm just curious because, you know, you and I come from some very similar backgrounds Mm -hmm. and we've worked in some similar, similar industries and we've seen our, our share of narcissists Mm -hmm. and um, really scary individuals, really. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, you know, media is full of people like that. You know, the next time you turn on the radio and hear your favorite DJ, you may not know them as well as you think you might. <laughs> the thing is, they probably don't know themselves as well as you think they might right. either. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's there's there's a lot of that in uh, in media. There's a lot of that uh, in um, medicine. There's a lot of it in. Um, Law places where law enforcement, where there's places of power or control, you'll tend to see that because that's where they tend to gravitate to because it naturally feels good to them. Um, and I mean, who wouldn't gravitate to what they feel they're good at or feels good to them? Anyone would do that. Um, but yeah. but people like this, excuse me, they're missing that piece in their mind. And do they know they're doing it all the time? Sometimes. Yeah, they do. Um and that's the scary part to all of us. Uh, but sometimes they don't. And But it's it's more of a way of life than it is a like a vindictive plan, I think. And that's the way to try to understand it. It's trying to understand something that's really not very understandable. And that's what makes you go in circles and ruminate on these people because there's nothing that will ever make them make sense. Want to listen ad-free? Want advanced access to all of our interviews before anyone else? Become a True Crime Today Premium Plus subscriber on Apple Podcasts. You get every episode commercial free. So you can binge on True Crime. Until you can binge no more. Search True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts now. Or go to our podcast page and sign up now. More of the Hidden Killers podcast next.